We're in the final stages of the build and rigging and mounting the tail feathers. Almost had a bit of a snafu that would have cost us a major setback. Yeah, so I definitely lost some sleep there while we were waiting for the numbers to I come back. I know you did. Because yep. <laughs> I was doing the math, like this means, like I started thinking how much right. rebuilding, and it would have been fairly significant to try to replace that spar. Dental work on airplanes. We took some liberties doing dental work that wasn't exactly in the instructions. We're closing in on the completion of this airplane. The engine install was covered previously, and this is some stuff that happened just before that. So I got this camera so I can be hands-free. Oh, you figured out the trick to put tape on your uh, mask so your glasses don't fog up? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> what a nightmare. What a nightmare. You can't see anything. Yeah. So, yeah, we're doing the best we can to work within the confines of mask mandates and so on. The core team members that I'm working with are Perry and his brother John. They're both retirees. And this is another episode of the Build Vlog following the process as we put together a Vans Aircraft RV-14. All right, so the first stage is to get her on her gear, yep. then hang the engine. Then we're going to bring the uh, hoist in, and we're going to pick it up. You know, we've got enough guys that we can stabilize it if that's required. Get up and then slide one gear, then the other. This is all the fittings that go in the back case of the engine. They need to be installed, especially that one, before you hang the engine, because you can't get at it. Right. Because the isolator motor mount actually interferes with that. All the fittings on here, are identified here, ready to grab and install. Then once all this is on the engine, then uh, we can uh, hang it. I think we'll have an engine hung today if everything goes smooth. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's exciting, man, that's huge. If you missed the engine episode, that one's definitely worth checking out. It's obviously a major milestone, but we also covered the differences between experimental and certified engines. I just wanted to get that one out before this content, which I didn't think was super exciting until going through the footage. I realized there was a problem which required a bit of a debrief with Vans Aircraft, which is what I'm intercutting into this episode. Remove the uh, 14112 plate covers from the aft fuselage. Well, that's, that's those little covers down here. Yeah. This is happening a little backwards. I guess the idea is I should have made this call before we file down the metal. <laughs> but the good news is, while I was editing, I saw, like, I, as you can see in the footage, you could tell that I was not entirely comfortable. It was just that Perry was so confident being my senior mentor. His confidence was built on, on a solid foundation of reason based on his experience. Yeah, so I think it's good to get ahead of that because this is maybe a mistake other builders might make in a similar situation because it is so similar. Go ahead, start hogging. Perry talked me through the process of calibrating the elevator travel. Yeah, so just take it, you know, a little bit at a time and we'll just work it up. A familiar process from his RV7 building history. Those specs are so that the aircraft will maneuver as it was designed to maneuver. And you're basically confirming that we are getting what we're supposed to get? Yeah, and if we're not, then uh, we can do some adjusting here. Yeah, so we're not getting what we're supposed to get right now. So you can see we need how much more up do we need. All right, so up spec is 30 degrees, and we're at 26.8. So that means we got to hog some metal out of here yeah. because the travel is being limited. The travel is being limited by this elevator horn right here. So we got to so hog some metal out of there until we get to uh, 30 degrees. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now on the down, Similarly, on the down, this horn is the one that's hitting here now, right? right. And that's pretty normal because just the nature of rigging? Yep, yep, I think so. So they make it with that in mind. Mm -hmm. They'd rather have more metal than you need and have to take some away than not have enough? Yeah, that's why they've got plus or minus here, so it's got to be adjustable. You don't want too much and you don't want too little. Looking at us doing the rudder, it is in the instructions that says file down the rudder stops if needed. We actually installed and calibrated the rudder range of movement before the elevator and it went smoothly. I got it, I got it. The objective is to get a maximum range of motion from the rudder while maintaining a minimum clearance from the elevator. <laughs> so we're looking at a fully deflected rudder with a minimum clearance of three quarters of an inch from impacting or interfering with the elevator. I think we got about a half. Yeah, it's, it's between three quarter and a half. I'm pushing. So in our case, instead of needing to file down the stops to get clearance, we actually needed to add the material, but again, that's addressed in the instructions. 
where you need to add the optional offset tabs but our clearances were completely symmetrical so it made a lot of sense it went completely smoothly just to add this tab to get the three quarters of an inch on each side so that the back of the rudder there did not interfere with the elevator skin and that's why it was fresh on our mind that removing material was something that could be done so it seems logical. While I was editing, I just went to really audit the instructions with great detail once again, because I was there working on it that day and I couldn't necessarily come to terms with exactly what Perry was suggesting doing, but he was sure. so confident, it's like, okay. But when I just couldn't find explicit instructions on how to deal with our issue, right. that's when I reached out and that's when you gave me the bad news that we weren't supposed to do that. Well, or or at least that it's not specified to do that. Yeah, so I guess, do you wanna talk me through what what happened on your end to clarify that, yes, we, got a, we dodged a bullet there, but that could have been bad. Sure, so Perry's experience is with building an RV7, which is similar, but not identical, where the RV7 definitely has material intended to be removed um, in order to make sure that that travel is you know, travels to this many degrees up and this many degrees down, the 14 is structured differently. And if you kind of just start cutting it like a seven, it's possible to get past a margin where, you know, you might have to replace a part. Yeah, so I guess we came close, but you guys ran the numbers to confirm we were still good. I think the thing, the thing that's important for people to realize and what, what you realized in this whole process is um, if you run across something and it is not in the plans on an RV 14, it's probably a good idea to ask. Before you do it. <laughs> The other thing that's really different between the 7 and the 14, and I'll show you here, is you can see the 7 instructions are very much paragraph style and nowhere near as specific in the steps as the RV14. Your instructions on the RV14, it's an 11 by 17 sheet with the drawings of exactly what you're working on and step 1, step 2, step 3, as opposed to this paragraph style where you have to refer to completely different drawings and figure out what you're looking at. That's something that's changed over time as well as the design. It turns out, lucky, I guess, right? But, you know, or fortunate, or both, that what Perry's experience led him to do... Dental work on airplanes. ...was basically what you would need to do on the RV-14, but you need one exercise a lot more caution in doing it. So what did we do? We took the pictures that you sent of the notching or the removal of material that had been done. And we did some analysis and measurements based on that and then ran the math through our, uh, one of our most senior engineers uh, who was involved in the design of that particular part uh, and determined that with the material that was removed that it is still, uh, it still contains the margin necessary to ensure that the part is structurally sound and safe. So we made that determination um, after the fact, but we made that determination and then that's what we reported back to you. So you're okay, structurally speaking, but when you switch from one airplane model to the other, sometimes things are a little bit different. And those subtle differences in terms of the way the structure is built on the horizontal stabilizer makes the RV-14, that rear spar, more sensitive to removal of material than like an RV-7 or an RV-8 might be. Yeah, so I definitely lost some sleep there while we were waiting for the numbers to I come back. So I started thinking yeah. how much <laughs> rebuilding, and it would have been fairly significant to try to replace that spar. The part is not very expensive. It takes a little bit of time. But one thing to keep in mind, Steve, is that learning to build an airplane is learning to build an airplane, right? Yeah. And it's not uncommon at all for people to have to maybe take something apart and fix it and put it back together. And you know, one of the great things, one of the reasons that experimental aviation exists in the first place is because it's an opportunity to learn and part of learning is making mistakes and figuring it out and then fixing them you know and that's that's just part of the process but you know i'm glad that it worked out the way that it did because i know you guys are making great progress on the project yeah we're, i think it was the idea that that might have meant we don't make osh i think we're still in a place where yeah. we're, we're we're pretty close to making osh i think ironically the thing that may stop us is like government paperwork so all that's happening all these different layers of things at the paperwork side and the construction side and we're coming yeah. to that final crunch like we're starting to look at the numbers and we're within like 100 days of air venture and that's our goal right is to get it there absolutely yeah, that'd be great yeah and, and with covid and stuff going on you know i mean all of the different just the situations that have presented themselves in multiple layers over the last year or so you know government agencies are slower than they used to be they're usually pretty slow as it is they're even <laughs> slower in some cases now trying to get these things done and in all seriousness transport canada has been super helpful getting us through all this paperwork and we're on track to make it to air venture and no doubt this year the vibe is going to be a little different. Among other things, they're strongly encouraging masks, so I decided to have a little bit of fun with that. 
We truly hope that you make it in, in the airplane. We know you'll be there. Hope you make it in the airplane. And if you don't, then it'll be the next one. Cool, man. Well, thanks so much for being so reachable. And, and I mean, yeah, we, we should have availed ourselves more. I think it's that balance of trying not to bug support too much, but also it's like, just call if you're not sure. It's not really bugging because, you know, <laughs> we're airplane builders and we're passionate about this stuff. And just like, you know, everybody who shows up at the museum to help build on the RV-14 in the group is really passionate about it. The people that work at Vans are the same way. You're like, you know, I mean, we geek out on this stuff and, you know, we're like airplane nerds and we're builders. So you need that block in there now because the rigging isn't complete. You had to have a spacer in there to hold that spot. Yeah, if we wanted to, we could put the rod end bearing through here, mm -hmm. but there's no point. And you knew the block was the same thickness, so yeah. it didn't matter. Yeah. What was our issue then? Were they out of spec or were they just... And those horns relative to each other may be clocked so they're not exactly matching each other. And, and it's not that there's anything wrong with yours per se, it's just that there was enough variability there that you know, the adjustment had to be made. So would that have been the prescribed solution? It's just that you guys would have said, stand by while we confirm how much you can take type of thing? Basically, yes. We would have told you, you can remove up to this amount. And the okay. amount that we would have said is okay to remove to start with probably would have been a little bit less than was removed. <laughs> yeah, right. And if you had to remove more than that, then we might say, let's take a look at the horns and, you know, would it make sense to replace one of them and think about the options that are involved. Right. As it is, the, the cut that was made was a little bit more than what we would have prescribed initially. Um, and that's why we did the engineering analysis to determine, you know, was it acceptable the way that it was done and determine that it was. There is zero and zero. So we got a wedge in there. I want to deflect it and I'll just film the okay. lever. Okay, all right, so now here we go, pull up. And we're looking for 30, right? Looking for 30. Yep, perfect. And, and down. pull down. And we're looking for 25. So stop pressing on it, because it's 25 threes. 25, yeah, so 25 with no pressure, perfect. Yep. All right. Yep. And here's an update that came to light during the fine cutting stage of this episode. Had we visited the service information and revisions section of the Vans website, we'd have seen that as it turns out, the spec that's published in the service info letter allows five degrees, so now we have the maximum available travel. When I was alone in the quiet hangar later that evening, I noticed there was some rubbing, so I marked it with green tape to discuss with Perry the following day. So this is a pretty normal part of the process to find some little interferences that you gotta fix? Yep. And it's just a matter of compressing the uh, radius on this so that the uh, the rivets that uh, join the, uh, the half radiuses together don't touch the um, hinge brackets. That's where they're gonna interfere. So it's meant to be so close so that when it's in neutral, there's almost no yep. space. Yeah, you don't want that gap there. Right? Yeah. But it's primarily gonna be where the, uh, where the weldments are because that's, you know, uh, about, uh, 32,000. So hope you enjoyed that one. There's more to come as we get closer to finishing. And after years of people bugging me, I have finally done it and opened a store. It was actually trying to get these masks done in time for AirVenture that inspired me. Um, they are expensive per unit, so we've added these patches and stickers to help offset costs if you want to buy that version. Just visit flightchops.store. And I did the best I could to tame this insane hair. But at this point, I'm going to let it ride, man. I'm going to see where this goes. It's finally flopped over. When it turned gray, it just started growing straight up. <laughs> but now it's actually flopped over. This is the longest I've had it in a long time.